Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Seo uh, with Benchmark Media Systems, and I have uh, Lori Fincham, uh, who is uh, uh, head of research at uh, THX Corporation. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, uh, high resolution audio and uh, what it takes to get uh, high resolution audio through, uh, through the entire system. Uh, one of the things that's uh, been really exciting for me in the last uh, few years is is just seeing uh, us go from 16-bit uh, uh, audio to finally being able to deliver high-resolution audio uh, to the living room and uh, being able to enjoy in my own living room uh, what we're used to hearing uh, in the recording studio. It's, there's always been a big disconnect between what we enjoy uh, uh, in a recording session and uh, what we experience uh, delivered from our uh, living room uh, audio system. And uh, so I, I think for all of us who are uh, lovers of audio and just uh, audio fans, it's, it's, I think the last few years have been uh, uh, probably the most exciting time in uh, 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 the development of uh, uh, high resolution audio, but one of the uh, one of the challenges is as the digital formats have have gotten better uh, as the d to a converters have gotten better uh, as our preamplifiers have gotten better um, we've we're uh, in, in each part of the chain is you know it it puts a demand on the next part of the chain. And uh, uh, so we're going to be talking about how those things uh, uh, work together, uh, what it takes to get true high res resolution audio to your speakers. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, I've been uh, with Benchmark, I guess, for about uh, uh, 18 years now, 15 years, something like that. It's hard to remember the number of years. Um, Benchmark uh, started uh, 30 years ago uh, as a pro audio company making audio equipment for broadcast television. Uh, we moved from broadcast television audio into uh, uh, audio for recording studios and uh, eventually we uh, uh, moved into uh, producing products for uh, home hi-fi. And part of that was our, our own passion for wanting that type of audio in our own uh, living rooms. And we really saw our, our D to A converters as, as one step toward bringing studio audio uh, into the home. And uh, uh, so uh, we're working through each part of the chain. Uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting to see all the things that the various companies are doing to uh, uh, to truly deliver uh, high resolution audio. Um, what, one of the things we want to do is um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of these subjects. We're going to talk about uh, an, an entirely new uh, amplifier technology uh, and what that does to help uh, deliver um, high resolution audio. Um, and uh, we're also going to open the second half up to, uh, uh, to questions. We'd like this to be uh, an interactive uh, workshop type format. Uh, if you've got some questions that come up uh, uh, in the process, uh, we'll try to address those as well. Um. Good morning. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Excellent. I don't know why I'm here, actually. I'm a, I'm a speaker man, uh, but somehow I've intruded into the amplifier space. Those of you who make speakers or have made them will know you're the messenger. You get blamed for everything that happened. So during my career, I've advanced up the chain interfering, and uh, that's what I'm doing this morning. So I want to talk about <coughs> amplifiers in particular. Um, over the years, we've seen that as the dynamic range of recorded material got greater and greater, we had to do one of two things. We either had to make speakers that were more efficient, and there's a limit to what you can do unless it's so big you can live inside it, or you, or you have to make amplifiers that are bigger too. Good amplifiers, I think we all probably agree, tend to be analog, the best ones. They're big and they're hot and they're heavy. 
and it, it doesn't scale. You know, once you 6 dB doesn't sound like too much, but four times the power is too much. So we, um, I was at uh, THX. We were actually working on a, on a line array. This had nothing to do with designing amplifiers at all. And this line array had uh, 96 speakers in it, 96 drivers, each one driven by a 100-watt amplifier. Pretty straightforward stuff. So we went to the lab, and we dug out these receivers that we had, and we piled them all up in a row. And we got the 9,600 watts, and we could barely live in the room. It was running so hot. So we got to thinking about how do we make an amplifier that delivers power and is very accurate, very quiet. It had to be very quiet with 96 speakers going, 96 drivers, a little bit of hiss from one didn't matter, with 96 shouting at you, we had to do something. So we thought about why shouldn't we make an amplifier that was very quiet. Now, typically, as I say, good amplifiers are probably class A. Uh, I think we pretty much agree that they set where, they, where the performance is. And with, then we had so-called digital amplifiers, not digital at all, they're switching amplifiers, they're just analog amplifiers going a bit faster, that's all. And uh, so you have the two camps, as it were. You have one, it's big and heavy and hot, and the other one where it's lighter and um, much more complicated, and it sprays RF around. So we asked, why couldn't it be analog? My, my pitch here was, if analog works, why switch? That was really the thought that I had. And so we looked at why amplifiers got hot. An amplifier is just basically a device that pulls energy from a power source in time with the music, essentially, is what happens. And two things happen with an amplifier. One is it, it, it creates heat when it's doing nothing, standing dissipation coming down there. In a class AB amplifier, it's what they call a standing bias. And we put that in to keep the distortion down. And it also cr um, um, creates heat when it's delivering music. Music has great peaks. Uh, the average power actually delivered to a, a speaker is only a fraction of the rating of the amplifier. I have a 100 watt amplifier. It's very rare you see an average power going in more than 5 or 10 watts. So we asked ourselves, how could we get the best of both worlds? How, how could we have relatively low dissipation, very low distortion, and extremely high quality? So that was it, and, and this is where we started. Well, the obvious thing to do is to to get rid of the standing dissipation and the heat, why don't we just turn the bias off? That's pretty straightforward. You can do that. Uh, unfortunately, the bias is there for a good reason. It's to get rid of the most pernicious of all distortions, which is called crossover distortion. Crossover distortion happens in an amplifier. You've got two parts. They don't quite marry one to the other, and they produce this nasty little spiky waveform, which is deeply unpleasant and was probably uh, responsible for all the original reservations that people had about solid state amplifiers. We, we didn't know how to measure it, we'd never really seen it before, didn't really understand it. Um, so what we've done is to combine two ideas. We've taken a regular class AB amplifier, turned the bias down to pretty, pretty small levels, maybe one or two milliamps in the output stage. That reduces the dissipation, and then we use a combination of feedback, which is great, and feed forward error correction for getting rid of the distortion. Now, feedback's nice. You put more on, the noise goes down, and the distortion goes down, but you can't keep piling it on. And it doesn't work very well at high frequencies. And unfortunately, crossover distortion is a high frequency phenomenon, and that's why we hear it. If it's very close to the fundamental of something you're listening to, it's masked and you don't hear distortion. Have this thing out here and you can hear it. It's just, it's just plain nasty. Error correction is a very interesting and simple idea, and I looked up today to see what the origins of this was. This was invented by Harold Blank, who invented feedback 90 years ago. We've made some progress, haven't we? He was with <laughs> Bell Telephone Labs, and he said, what we need is error correction. We find out what comes out of the end, and we know what went in in the middle, and we know how much of the gain there was. The difference between the two, I can feed it in back to front, and the distortion vanishes, and it could go to zero. Except in order to do this, he had to invent an amplifier with constant gain, and he did that by inventing feedback. So it's sort of curious. So we've gone right back to the beginning here. We've gone back and looked at error correction. That's what we have in this amplifier that you see here. Now, the point about error correction is it has to be at exactly the right level, and it has to be exactly in time. 
otherwise it won't cancel correctly. And what, what we decided to do here, we use a bridge circuit in this amplifier for getting the error correction. Sorry if this is a bit technical, but the, the interesting part is that if you have precise components, you can get exact cancellation. So we don't use inductors. There are, uh, there are, no, there are no inductors in this amplifier as part of the feedback circuitry. And the reason we don't do that is inductors are rather nasty devices. Uh, I know most amplifiers have them in. There are two types. Either you have a core in there, in which case they become nonlinear, and we're talking about getting very low distortion, or they air cord, in which case they don't have distortion, but unfortunately they talk to one another, so you get crossed up, they all link together. So this doesn't have that at all. It just uses precision capacitors and resistors, which you can get in very close tolerance, and you can also get very high quality ones. So we use feed forward error correction, and we can get the distortion down to vanishingly low that is so low, we couldn't even use the measuring equipment that's on the market. Now, it may be thought that who cares about distortion? What's the difference in that and what we hear? I take the view that you make it as good as you can and then just hope it sounds good. I'm a, I'm a musician part of the time, and I know that what we hear doesn't always correspond with measurements, but I think most of us would agree that when you put your ear up to a speaker, you don't want to hear anything if nothing's happening at the other end. It should be absolutely quiet. Uh, so we got the noise down vanishingly small, and we got the distortion down. That's part one. We dealt with that. What about when the speaker's actually playing and we're delivering power? With an amplifier, it's drawing this power from the source. You really only need just the volts that you need for the music. You just want to make sure you've got enough across the load that it doesn't clip and give you a distortion. Any more than that, you just w it goes up in heat. So we use tracking, uh, tracking power supplies. This is not new. What you have is two power supplies. One sits here, and at a much higher level, you have the one that comes in when needed, and it follows the music along. The problem has been that when you switch from one to the other, again, you've got like a form of crossover distortion, a little click, it goes in, and you couldn't get rid of it. The nice thing about error feed forward is it does the same thing for the switching between the rails as it does for the crossover distortion. So in, with these two bits going together, you can get very low distortion and extremely low noise. Now, this amplifier that we got here, that John will probably talk about in a minute, this was um, co-invented. I'm the senior person and I pay the bill, so I get my name on the pat, but really all the work, the hard work was done by my partner in crime who lives in England I, I never, we, we never see one another, we just talk on the phone and do circuits on the phone. And his name is Owen Jones, and he has a twin brother, identical twin brother, who works for Pioneer and Tad, who's actually, actually at the actually show. Actually a mirror twin. Yes, they mirror the left and right twins, which is hard enough for most people. Um, so he, he's actually in England at the moment, so I came over to represent him uh, today and just talk about this. What we'd like to do is to really have a sort of to and fro and talk about how we do the various bits and pieces. There's lots of stuff that went into this amplifier um, to make it work. This is not a product pitch. It's talking about what are the real problems yet to be solved, how have we gone about solving it, and does it work? And in the end, you're going to tell us if it works. If it sounds good, it sounds good. And if it measures well, then jolly good as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, um we found out w w we had a uh, amplifier project in process, and uh, we got talking at uh, I believe it was uh, the AES show in uh, San Francisco, may have been one of the shows I don't know, uh, but um, um, we uh, uh, really had a, a common approach to uh, uh, creating a high quality piece of equipment, looking to you know. Each each of the artifacts. How far can we reduce those? Um, not not always asking, is that audible? Is that good enough? But can we reasonably make it better? Uh, can we reduce uh, uh, this distortion artifact? Can we reduce that uh, uh, particular problem? And um, um, you know, we got talking about uh, uh, what THX was. Uh, was doing with their with their new patents uh, and and how we might be able to put that together uh, into an amplifier that uh, that would 
take us from the typical 105 dB signal to noise ratio that a lot of amplifiers have, uh, uh, take us uh, to distortion levels that are 122 dB uh, or 120 dB uh, uh, below peak output um, and uh, achieve low distortion right up to uh, the peak output. And uh, 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 one of the things that uh, is interesting, you know, our, our project started out with a box that was full rack width wide, uh, it was three rack units high. And uh, because of the fact that we're able to incorporate um, tracking rails, uh, it's allowed us to make something that's that's much smaller, um, but uh, uh, every bit uh, the performance of the larger box would have been, but with lower distortion. The uh, feed uh, the feed forward uh, correction uh, allows us to get rid of the crossover distortion uh, and the distortion from the uh, uh, class H or tracking rail switching and. Uh, uh, really, it hasn't been practical to use tracking rails in a uh, in a high quality amplifier, um, uh, really until uh, the incorporation of this uh, uh, the, the feed forward network. So, if I could just interject here, um, we talk about noise in amplifiers, and, and noise is really of two kinds noise that you ought to know about if you're a circuit designer you ought to be able to figure out how to get the noise down and noise that you didn't expect to get what happens is noise comes in from everywhere it comes in from the power supplies it comes in from adjacent equipment and and, and so forth and part of what we tried to do in looking at this uh, design we we could do the circuit stuff and it more or less worked you know simulation is pretty pretty advanced now and you can get fairly close but um, as the moment you've got high currents moving around in the system, they just come in from everywhere. So part of what we tried to do with um, an amplifier, I don't like things with lots of leads and things that can go wrong and variability and so forth. So this just basically clips together. Everything is tracks on a board or it's, or it's uh, uh, connectors where you can put together. Of course, it takes a long time to get it right because we really don't know what we're doing. How the things that matter in a circuit aren't in the circuit at all, they're stray capacitance, and that's just a bit of luck, a bit of experience, and a bit of honest in endeavor. So this particular amplifier here is a, just a couple of sandwich boards that are put together. All the, uh, the input connectors actually go straight onto the board so that at least if it's bad, it's consistently bad. Of course it isn't, but, but the point I'm making is you don't want to just see a lab queen that gives great results and then when you go and buy yours you wonder why it isn't, it isn't as good. So noise has, has been a really difficult thing to get rid of. The other thing that isn't in here very much is op amps. Op amps are designed by people who make op amps for a living and they want to sell millions of them. So they want to hit the middle of their market. They won't just do what you want to do. We have uh, quite high tracking rails in this system because it's better to have high voltages than high currents to get a good design. And so it's pretty much all discrete components and then we can have exactly the circuit topology that we want. We did at one time look at getting a chip made by a very famous uh, a chip company, but they wanted to do what they wanted to do and they wanted to redesign it. So we decided in the end just to go along with, a, with an all discrete uh, design where we know what the various bits and pieces do. makes it quite complicated. There's quite a lot of bits in here and we had a few interesting moments leading up to the show. It is thought this may work, by the way, um, just so that you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those of you who have ever been in R&D will know what a show is about. I had black hair about two <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> exactly. In fact... Uh, so did know, he. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, as of, I think it was Monday or Tuesday of this week, uh, we had no working units, I think. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we have here at the show two working units. We have one uh, up in uh, room 1000. Uh, we've been doing live demos uh, uh, for the duration of the show, and, and uh, it's, it's pretty neat to go up and... Uh, and take a listen to it. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we're quite pleased about is that, that, that we've met our performance goals, uh, that we're really close to 130 dB uh, signal-to-noise ratio. 
uh, we are uh, below 120 dB uh, distortion over the entire power range, including running in bridge mono mode. So uh, we're not seeing a the usual degradation in uh, uh, THD when you go to bridge mono. Uh, it's staying uh, every bit as clean uh, in in uh, bridge mono. But uh, one of the uh, uh, things that's quite different about this uh, amplifier is that the the power supply is is a uh, switching power supply. Uh, one of the things that we've done as a company uh, is we've moved away from uh, linear power supplies. And the reason we've moved away from linear power supplies is that uh, they put out very strong 60 hertz fields. And the 60 hertz magnetics uh, tend to get into uh, uh, the electronics uh, 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 and be very hard to eliminate from from the circuit. You, magnetic shielding is is a lot more difficult to do than electrostatic shielding. And um, so, by going to uh, 500 kilohertz switching frequency, uh, two things happen: the magnetics are are no longer in band. Uh, the interference that you get is is at high frequencies and is easily filtered out. Uh, the bigger part of the story is that the strength of the magnetic fields is significantly lower. Uh, the size of the magnetic components are significantly smaller. We're, we've got transformers that are about that big instead of about this big. And uh, so uh, this is really something that uh, we discovered in our uh, microphone preamplifier and uh, A to D converter, D to A converter designs. Uh, was that we were infinitely better off with switching power supplies than we were with linear power supplies. And, and that, that really flies in the face of uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, conventional wisdom would be uh, use a linear supply because uh, linear has got to be uh, better than a switching supply. Now, uh, I don't want to create any confusion. The, the amplifier itself is not a switching uh, amplifier. It's a linear amplifier. It's only the power supply that's uh, supplying the, uh, the power rails. And in this case, we need multiple power rails because we've got, uh, we've got a high bias rail, we've got the tracking rails, and we've got the, uh, uh, the main rails, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly complicated uh, power supply. Uh, but one of the other things that's, that uh, is different uh, from uh, conventional design is that uh, it's a tightly regulated supply. Uh, usually, uh, in a uh, power amplifier, you use an unregulated supply. And uh, uh, once we made the decision to go to a, a switching supply, uh, if you do the analysis, it, it, it makes all the sense in the world to go to uh, regulated supply. You get the best overall efficiency um, based on the size of the uh, 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 power supply. John, I wanted to uh, change the subject just for a moment, if I may. We're talking about high res today, and we're talking about recordings. And one of the questions that may come up is, why 130 dB? Seems like an awful lot. And uh, many years ago, when we were digital recordings were first starting, I, I played in a jazz group. I played string bass, and uh, the drummer came down one day, and we got him to do some recordings. And it's amazing for the. Uh, how many of you, by the way, actually do recordings as opposed to just liking? Is there anybody in the audience who does recording? I think there's a Mr. Atkinson up there who's also English and plays the bass reputedly. Um, but the interesting thing was <coughs> just how loud the sounds were. In the old days of recording, you used to have magnetic tape. Now, magnetic tape was sort of your friend in a way. It was a built-in soft limiter. We didn't really talk about it very much, but if the, it, it would just saturate a bit. And if, if it was friendly tape, it was, it was OK. When digital came along, you could go right up to the limit of the converters. And this was a shock to everybody, because they weren't ready for it, and they cut the tops off, and then they put in limiters and so forth. I got him just to take a, a, a single drumstick and drop it onto a snare drum in an anechoic chamber, and that was 128 dB. It didn't sound, this doesn't sound very loud, but believe me, it's extremely loud. If you, any of you play the piano, 
you should probably have earplugs in because a um, friend of mine who played in the group, we just put a microphone in his ear to see how loud a piano was. And that was about 126 dB just playing chords and so forth. So you do need that. And in the recording process, we almost no microphone has this dynamic range. What they do is they choose horses for courses. If you've got something on the bass drum, you put it in close, it needs to be handled really high sound levels. If you're doing a recording of a concert, you need to pick up. So they have lots of microphones that maybe have 60 or 80 dB, but they put them all together and this is where the 130 appears. So, of course, we don't listen up to 130, at least. Most of us don't or can't. Or we listen at a much lower level. I mean, we, we have systems at work where we define it as being cinema level, and it goes up to 120 dB. Practically everybody we know turns it down to about half volume, which is about 10 dB lower. So there is a case for having 130 dB, because you never quite know where the music is going to come. Um, we're associated with uh, Lucasfilm, which has Skywalker sound. They have one of the quietest recording areas that you've ever seen. And I said, well, what are you going to do with your 24 bits? And they said, well, we're going to keep four bits in our back pocket is what we do. So we never know what's going to happen. So we have that headroom, and then we can adjust it afterwards. So I think the key thing here is, if you're going to get high resolution, and I have to say that it's the first time I've been to the Rocky Mountain show. I'm afraid I get involved with the... AES or the nasty CES shows. And one of the most reassuring things is that people have said, wouldn't it be nice if we could capture high-res recording and people could hear what we could routinely hear a few years ago, and we don't hear now. I mean, CDs when they came out were 16 bits, but I've got to tell you, the dynamic range of recorded material has gone like this over mm -hmm. the years as they compress it for the lowest common denominator for people who stick things in their ears or want to, want to download it in compressed form. So if we get anything from this show is we want to spread the word uncompressed music, high res thing is really the thing to do in it. And here what I've seen is lots of people just loving the music and putting the, putting the stylus down or whatever it is, just playing it. And we want to have a delivery system which is capable of, of, of dealing with it. So that's really what this is about. It doesn't, yeah. it sounds a bit technical, yeah, and it is, and that's the boring part, but we're really interested in the music. That's how we all got into the business in the first place, and we want to share, I think, I hope anyway, some of our love of music with, uh, with the rest of them. So uh, maybe we should ask if there are any questions in the audience, because I think we've covered a lot of ground here from the esoterics of amplifier design and the theory, but what we're really talking about is how do we get the best out of our music and why should high res matter? So yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, we've got a sort of mobile microphone here. So, uh, if they're difficult questions, please address them to John. How <laughs> <laughs> would this be uh, different from what, what Bob Carver did back in the 80s with his amplifiers? The, the main difference is he was using uh, tracking. In fact, I was reminiscing with some with John recently. We used uh, Carver cubes in in bridge format in about 1980 to get the dynamic range that we needed with the uh, uh, digital recordings. He had a tracking supply, but he wasn't dealing either with the business of the standing dissipation, and he wasn't dealing with the crossover distortion. So it's this is a combination of ideas. I mean, if feedback is is um, 75 years old or 80 years old and feed forward is 90. What we're doing is refining it. And so it's different. Everybody builds on the past. Nobody's a, a true original. You owe it to somebody else and you take it and you challenge yourself. Um, I think the main difference today is that we have better tools at our disposal, both for measurement and simulation. Instead of just being cut and try and the show's coming up and you have to stop. Uh, at least now you can say, what should it be, what is it, and so forth. And, and that's the primary difference. This was a very interesting device, which, but it was, it was a little bit raw. If, if you remember, you could actually hear uh, taxi sounds coming in on it, and every time it went on, it boom, and everything, and the, and the line went up and down. It's a bit interesting. But he, he had the same idea. He said, why don't we match the output capability of the amplifier with the requirements of the music rather than from somebody who just wants to stick sine waves. We, we must have sine waves for testing, but we're going to listen with music, and that's been the feature. We want to know what it does with real-world signals. 
we're going to switch here so that we can uh, get two of these microphones uh, passing around. Um, and I encourage you to, to grab a microphone uh, uh, to, to ask any questions. We've got one in the back there. I think maybe two in the back. All the way back. Sorry. Test. Um, I come from a chip background where we do a lot of simulation models. And the way it works is the foundry gives us some models. We use that for simulation. And then, um, and then we get a chip and we find out it doesn't really match. Um, you mentioned you were using models. Are you doing like a spice sim type models and how well does it match in the discrete sense? That's yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, we've done is uh, we always do uh, spice simulations. Uh, um, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, work on spreadsheets. Uh, uh, I, I do a lot of noise calculations uh, on spreadsheets where uh, every resistor in the circuit, um, every uh, amplifier stage in the circuit is uh, tabulated on the, uh, on the spreadsheet. Uh, and I can look at the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the spreadsheet and see what the uh, signal to noise ratio is going to be uh, through the circuit. Um, uh, that, that's, that's essential when you're trying to uh, design to, to uh, 130 dB uh, signal to noise ratio. Every single stinking tra uh, resistor in the, uh, in the circuit becomes uh, uh, really important. And uh, if you try to make the, the resistances too low, uh, sometimes you uh, increase distortion. So you got to, you have to. Make, it's it's always a balancing act. You got to, and, and you've got to select the right uh, drive devices to make sure that you don't get distortion when you go to very low impedances. Uh, um, uh, the uh, so so spreadsheets, uh, spice simulations. Uh, um, uh, and 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 then uh, when it when it comes to the actual uh, fabrication and layout of the board, uh, there's there's uh, very specific things that we have to do to uh, try to avoid uh, magnetic field interference, to uh, avoid electrostatic interference. We we build with uh, a minimum of six layers on our printed circuit boards, uh, and the outside layers are. Uh, solid ground plane. So if you look at the bottom of the board, there's no traces. If you look at the top of the board, there's no traces. Uh, everything is built inside out. Now, unfortunately, that makes it extremely hard to uh, rework a board. And uh, and you know when we're doing R and D, and we got to put the little green wires on. Uh, but uh, uh, what it does is it creates a complete uh, electrostatic shield uh, above and below the uh, circuitry. Uh, but that's not enough. You still have to stitch uh, ground vias all the way around the board to seal the edges of the board uh, to make a complete box. And then uh, you can take critical parts of the circuit that maybe have to go from this part of the board to that part of the board uh, and box them in uh, to their own uh, uh, electrostatically shielded box. Uh, yeah. We've got a few questions to okay. get through I'm here, sorry. so I'm wondering if we see, uh, noticing the time is moving on. Just a question about how your topology deals with uh, complex real-world loads as opposed to, uh, you know, simple testing loads. It's, it's designed to work into any, any expected load. That, that's originally, when we were making the line array, of course, we knew what the load was. So at that stage, we haven't put in all the protection circuitry. When he ca he's a bit of a fussball, this John, I'll probably tell you. It's an English expression, but I think it's attention to detail, he calls it. And he insisted that it was stable into all sorts of loads, including capacitive leads and, and, and so forth. I mean, I guess somebody will find a load. You, know, you, you can't try them all. <laughs> well, yeah. But we've, we've, done our, we've done our best to make sure that they don't break. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so, okay, we have a nice amp, uh, but wouldn't be it quality kind of add done by crossover networks that in speakers? And wouldn't it, and the second question probably wouldn't be this amplifier better positioned to active systems uh, rather than passive ones? 
we, we'll never get an argument for a speaker man about active speaker yeah. systems. It's just, it took a long time. In fact, curiously enough, active speakers only became accepted for, for first of all, be with uh, Kenny Hemi. Kenny Hemi now? Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, uh, as a speaker man, we, I would agree you, you don't really want passive crossovers, but it took a long time to be accepted. And two things made it possible. First was the beginning of 2.1 systems where the subwoofer, in order to be small, had to have an amplifier built in. And much later on, it had to do with multimedia speakers where amplifiers were there. So I, I would agree with you. But if you look at the show here, what you're looking at, I would say 99% of the speakers are, are, are passive. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I did for many, many years. And so I learned a lot about passive crossovers and how to make that work with the amplifier. Uh, I'll tell you this, that it's no good measuring a, a, an amplifier just with a resistive load. It's a lot of fun and makes you feel good. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but when you get these very complex loads, and when you're a speaker designer, you sort of, your feeling is, it's an amplifier's job to supply exactly what I want. It's not mine. And when you're an <laughs> amplifier designer, you say, every speaker should be like an 8 ohm resistor. So that battle has gone on over the years. I think amplifier people have learned what to do, and some speaker people have, although I have to say that uh, sometimes uh, the impedance of a speaker can be uh, an, an interesting project. This one, this amp, just for the fun of it, we wanted to see what it would do. It's, um, it's basically 100 watts into 8 ohms, you know, which is up to, but it'll actually deliver something like 30 amps for the old 8 ohm speaker that looks like 1.2 ohms at some frequency, yeah. just to make sure it doesn't make nasty noises. So, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, we may get there uh, someday, but you know, part of the fun of, of doing speakers is it's something you can do in your backyard. It's about the only thing you can do in your backyard. Amplifiers you can't now. It's too too complicated. But, yeah. uh, I'm a big fan of uh, of active speakers uh, and active, I mean, active crossovers. That's because he sells more amplifiers. I don't need <laughs> to do this. This is, this is the commercial. No, but but uh, uh, quite seriously, the uh, uh, the electronic or the active crossover uh, is is far better than uh, uh, or far easier to to build than than a passive crossover. Uh, right now, the uh, uh, the home hi-fi industry is still um, very much uh, uh, kind of uh, stuck in the world of uh, passive uh, crossovers. Uh, we've seen the uh, the pro audio uh, uh, market uh, almost completely transition to uh, active monitors. Uh, and uh, the problem is you don't always get a good amplifier attached to the back of the uh, uh, of the monitor. Uh, the uh, speaker people know how bad their speakers are, and they say, "Well, we don't really need that good an amplifier anyway." <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? I, I think we had a. Did we have another question? Somebody in the back there. Have we exhausted everybody? I think. No, I, th I think that's about it. So anyway, on, on behalf of, of John, I'd like to thank him for inviting me here and, and you for coming and putting up with this load of old nonsense. But oh, we've got another question. Hold on. Okay, this was the question we've been waiting okay. for. <laughs> I zipped out to do something. I just missed the very beginning, so I didn't catch your name in background, sir. So uh, could you repeat that? My name's Laurie Fincham, like, like the girl, but it's short for Lawrence in England. And, uh, <laughs> It's been like that forever. And I worked for uh, THX in California, and formerly I was with uh, uh, KEF in England for 25 years, Infinity, Celestian, and Gooden. So I, in my early days, I used to design 12-inch drivers for rock and roll bands. That's what I did, because I played. <laughs> I have some 25-year-old KEF speakers, so. Okay. See you all right. Thank, thanks for the pug, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Glass of water is coming your way afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, John.